Okay. I'm going to go in through the introduction, talk a little bit about the surge valve. Then to give you an understanding of why the surge valve is needed in today's fields, I'll be talking a little bit about the characteristics of horizontal wells and how the slugs tend to affect some of those horizontal wells. Next, I'll be talking about the rod pumps and how it affects the free gas can affect the rod pump because so far the surge valve has been mainly introduced in the rod pumps, but is also applicable in horizontal and ESPs or your gas lifts. It's really applicable for any artificial lift, but right now we've just been seeing rod pumps. Next, I'll be talking about our traditional solutions that we've seen before this innovation. So your typical tools, such as your regular gas separators, your natural gas separators, and things you see on the market already. Next, I'll be talking about the surge valve and a case study that we recently saw and how it really increased the production and decreased the gas production in this well and helped keep the pump village a lot more about double than what it was before that surge valve was introduced then i'll be going to conclusion and like shivani said please feel free to stop me at any point ask any questions if there's anything that may be a little unclear just let me know especially for the people online i appreciate y'all being here as well so if you have any questions just turn on your mic we'll be able to hear you in this room as well so the flow regimes what do we normally see in in our producing wells, we see different types of flow regimes, whether it be your horizontal wells or your vertical wells. And if you look at the graph on the left, most of the times when you see that high liquid velocity, we will see bubble flow. Bubble flow is what you see in the beginning of the life of the well. So the bubble flow is when the gas is not really free yet. It's a little bit more in solution. This is not something that really affects any of the producers. It's not something that we think we need to focus on at the moment until we start to see that slug elong elongated bubble flow. The slug and elong elong elongated bubble flow is not really as common in vertical wells because where that slug is produced is in the kickoff point when you see that turbulence. And with a vertical well, you can usually just put the pump below the well and you're not seeing that slug. And with in a vertical well, that gas just flows upwards and you're not seeing it uh, coalesce into the slugs that you would normally see in a horizontal well. And also, another, the other most common two phase of gas and liquid in a horizontal well will be your stratified wavy or your stratified. So this will be in the well when you start to see the fluid production depleted a little bit more. So you're not, you might be seeing 50% of oil and 50% uh, gas, but this is normally what you would see, like if you hold a bottle, bottle sideways, it's fluid on bottom, gas on top, because that gas is able to, to expand a little bit more and get into a two-phase situation. So field evaluation, diagnostic, like I was saying, in the beginning of a horizontal well. Beginning of a horizontal well, you will see mainly bubble flow. In the beginning, this is about 7% of your total production, so it's not really an issue. But as that, as that well starts to produce more, you're going to start seeing that pressure decrease because that fluid level starts to decrease. That well is not, especially now in horizontal wells and fracking, those wells aren't going to hold the production very long. What we see in the Permian Basin and fracking wells a lot is that that production depletes very quickly. So within six months to a year, you'll start to see that free gas finally start to break out a little bit more. And and that fluid level start to decrease and that therefore decreases the production and allows that fluid that gas to start to break free from that fluid and this is where you really start to see the issue so in the beginning 20 percent free gas is a little bit more like doable a lot more easy for maybe the pump to handle but when you start getting down to the longer of the longer run life of the well when you start seeing 10 months 12 months you might start seeing 80 percent free gas in the well 85 percent 88 percent and that's when you can really start to burn out that ESP or start to gas lock, gas lock those rod pumps. So to give you a little visualization of the gas behavior in the horizontal wells, 
Here's uh, something that Odessa Separator did in the past. We were able to see, to demonstrate the horizontal wells in a controlled environment. So just imagine this is a couple of meters long, a couple of feet long. So this is definitely scaled down to size. So you'll be able to see the difference, but it'll still give you an idea of the way the gas behavior tends to behave in these horizontal wells, especially during the kickoff point is something that you want to keep your eye on. So this one, you can see that this is more of a wavy stratified flow with the gas on top and the fluid on bottom. And once you start to get to that kickoff point, that's when you start seeing that turbulence in that fluid slippage of the fluid going into the vertical, slipping back down, and it's just a lot of collapsing, a lot of collisions of fluid and gas in that area. This one's sort of, it's pretty similar, but this is more stratified. Maybe when your well's producing way less in the beginning, this is maybe towards the end. This is a well that you're going to see that's been on, been running for probably a couple of years by this point. So you're going to see a lot of stratified in the horizontal. Oops. So you're going to see a lot of stratified in the horizontal, but when you get to that kickoff point, that's when you're going to start seeing a lot of that fluid slippage, that fluid's going to be falling back down. So, and your fluid level will start to decrease in the vertical and a lot of that fluid will stay in the horizontal. And lastly, this is the second most, this is the other most common two phase production in horizontal wells is that slug form. So here you can see that there's a big gap, big surge of fluid that happens. And then afterwards, there's a big gas pocket that happens after that. So what happens when you get that surge fluid and then when gas behind it, then your pump will get that surge fluid. But then afterwards, there may just be a little bit of time period where it's producing just that gas. And that's some of the issues we are seeing today is even if you may have a gas separator, what's that gas separate? What's that gas separator going to separate when there's not enough fluid? It's just going to be pulling gas at that point. So how are how are gas slugs formed in the horizontal? Like I was saying earlier, when the gas when the fluid starts to deeply and you start seeing a lot less pressure, that that uh, gas will start to be able to expand more freely and produce into the pump. Also, another thing that I haven't mentioned is the geometry of the well. If you see heels, so heel sections, none of the horizontals are completely completely straight. So in the heel section, there might be some fluid that starts to accumulate. I mean, think of it as a zigzag. I mean, there might be little pockets, but in those pockets, you start to see fluid accumulate, and then you might start to see more gas slugs due to the geometry of the well. And as mentioned before, also the different densities of the well will definitely start to accumulate that free gas, gas expansion due to the pressure depleted. So this is what we see in a normal well, but what happens when you convert to a rod pump? What, does, what effect does free gas start to have in a rod pump? Well, it can start off with small issues, delay in the valve opening, you're getting less efficiency from the rod pump. You're now seeing pump fillage of 50, 60% versus 80 when the fluid level is a little bit higher. You start to see low efficiency, low, low fluid uh, fillage. Then you start then you start seeing bigger issues in the rod pump. You start seeing your your pump having to get, uh, introduce higher power cons consumption to pull that fluid. And then gas locking, gas pounding. What is gas locking? When that pump fillage is, goes from seventy to like forty, you, that that valve starts taking longer to open. So what happens when you start getting even lower than 40, 30, that valve will then not open. And what happens when that valve doesn't open? It's just a pressure vacuum inside of that rod pump. And then at that point, you're not going to be able to produce. And that, you can kind of start to see it as a failure. And gas pounding is another big issue right before that gas lock. So right before gas locks, it might open really late. And when it happens really late, it's going to hit that fluid. And that creates a lot of rod buckling inside the entire system. So if that rod string is 4,000 feet long, just imagine how much vibration is occurring in that entire rod string above that and how much damage that gas pounding or that fluid pounding can have on that rod system. And like I was saying, that rod system, all that buckling, it can hit the tubing, the rods can buckle, 
this leads to premature e equipment failure due to high stresses. And this is where the real big bucks start to happen is you have to do a work over because your gas, your gas separation wasn't effective enough or you're not pulling enough fluid. And then at that point, your cost will double or triple because you have to have a work over. You're losing production from that well being down, from that rod pump being broken. So it just starts to kind of stack up when you get to that point. So when you start to see low efficiency and gas log, gas counting, that might be something where you can kind of take mitigation, mitigation measures before that. And like I said before, effective free gas, you can see on the left side, that's where the rod buckling can come in contact with the tubing. You can replace, have to replace the tubing, then also have to replace the bucking. Like I said, this is where you're gonna see a lot of that issue, a lot of gas pounding, fluid pounding, gas locking, so. And even though just right here, it is uh, just the rod pumps, you will see a lot of these issues in the ESP as well with the free gas going in. You will see gas locking and the impellers and start to burn out those motor cables because that free gas. So right now, what are the original two ways that people, uh, that you would be able to, the two things that differentiate between a horizontal well and a vertical well and a conventional, Vertical well, there's some, there's a little bit more of a simple solution that you can do versus a conventional well. And a vertical well, what you can do is just place the pump below the perforations. Because if you put the pump below the perforations, that's just a natural gas separator. Gas is lighter than fluid. The fluid will fall, but the gas is just going to rise. So at, in a conventional well, you can really mitigate the issues of having gas and in that well just by putting it below the perforations. But that will lead to a secondary issue because if there's sand or if you frack that well, then the sand will fall into the pump and you will start to see more sand issues in that well. So there will there is a pros and cons each way. So if you can just analyze what's more appropriate for that well. Secondly, for unconventional wells, this is not really an option because where are the perforations in a horizontal well? They're in a horizontal in the horizontal and how are you gonna get your pump below those perforations? That's really not an option in the horizontal wells. So this is why in most unconventional wells, you will start to see that you need a gas separator in that case. You might not have the sand issues that of uh, being below the perfs, but you will see a lot more gas issues because that gas is traveling straight up and will travel straight into the pump itself. So in these cases, you will need to start using a gas separator. So what are the traditional solutions right now that we've seen on the market? These are the solutions that have been on the market for years and years. First off, you have a natural gas separator. This is what I was just mentioning just a minute ago was putting your pump below your perforation. So you just have that natural gas separation from gravity itself and fluid traveling downwards. And to put below your pump, you can just use tubing that's perforated and the fluid will go in there and the gas will travel upwards. Natu a modified natural gas separator tends to work the same way, except you use a dip tube instead of a tubing, instead of tubing, because the dip tube gives you more annular area. And that's the, uh, the main concept of gas separation is slowing down that fluid velocity to half a foot per second. So if you're using regular tubing, the annular area between the tubing and the casing is a lot smaller than it is if it's a dip tube and the casing. So utilizing a dip tube and the casing will allow you to slow down that fluid velocity and achieve a better gas separation versus just natural gas separator. Then we have our poor boy. As you can see from this picture, the poor boy is when you cannot go below the, the gas separator, below the perforations. So the poor boy gas separator utilizes just the regular tu your tubing size and a dip tube inside of it. So you have your perforations on your tubing above the entrance of your dip tube because in this case, you want the fluid to change directions. And it's a little bit harder for that fluid to change directions than it is for that fluid to change directions. So even just a simple poor boy gas ever can be seen as a pretty useful tool in when you can't go below the perforations. Next is a modified poor boy separator. It works the same way, except the body is more oversized. So if you have two and seven of these tubing, 
then you would oversize that body to about three and a half or four, depending on your casing size. And that just gives more annular space for you to slow down that fluid velocity in between the dip tube and the, and the tubing. So that would be the fourth one. And lastly is a packer type gas separator. And this can be seen as one of the more efficient type of gas separators. Cause as I was saying, the annular space in the packer type gas separator, you are uh, utilizing the annular space between the casing and the tubing versus four boy gas separator where you don't utilize an annular space between the tubing and the dip tube. So utilizing that bigger annular space allows you to slow down that fluid velocity even more. So the packer type gas separator can be seen, but it just has the drawbacks of having to use a packer, like as some people may not like to use. So innovation, this is where the surge valve comes in. So the surge valve features a, reg a regulator system that homogenizes the production fluid into a monophasic phase. Monophasic phase, we're putting the gas slugs back into solution first step because you just don't want that free gas going straight into the pump. You want to at least break apart that big gas slug into the bubbles, as I mentioned earlier, because bubbles are a lot more easy for the fluid to, for the pump to handle than a regular big gas slug. Secondly, it creates a one directional flow of production. So in this case, the surge valve is used with the packer. And I was mentioning earlier, a gas separator can only do so much. If your fluid level is starting to deplete a lot, as we see in horizontal wells, and then it's just not able to pull enough fluid. And at that point, you're pulling the gas no matter what. No matter what type of gas separator you have, you can't pull fluid if there is no fluid level. So this surge valve kind of creates, you can see it more kind of as a standing valve below the pump, an extra standing valve. So have that surge of fluid that you saw from the video earlier, and you're able to capture that fluid above the packer and don't allow it to fall back down because if that surge valve isn't there, then it's creating, it's just falling back down in that turbulent zone that you see in the other video from that demonstration that we did. And it also has a spring bypass system for treatment below the packer. So just because we have a one-way directional flow doesn't mean we don't have a alternated tool to allow you to treat below the packer. If you need to acid treat the purse or get some other chemical below the packer, you need to bypass that one-way directional flow. There's a spring system that allows you to do that as well. Some of the benefits you will see from this are to prevent the low, produ low productivity because of gas interference and reduce the shutdowns of pumps because most rod pumps, you will see that they have some sort of device, say a pump off controller or a variable speed tool that Based on the pump fillage, it will either or the yeah. Based on the pump fillage, it will shut down the pump for a little bit until it starts to see that fluid rise, or it will slow down the speed of the stroke of the pumps until it's able to uh, recognize that it does have a higher pump fillage, and then it can speed back up to pull more fluid. Because the best way to naturally use your rod pump for gas separation is to slow down your strokes or elongate your strokes. So. Here's a quick video that can. One second. Look at this. 
You can see that on the Zoom. animation to show you some of the things you might see in your pump cards or your production or some of the things you're able to read. So this would be your, your pump without the surge valve. This is the free gas going straight into the pump and how it can affect it. You can see the production goes down and the pump fillage will drop too. But the fluid level tends to rise when you see those gas slugs because you would think that the fluid level decreased, but the fluid level actually de increases because it's pulling gas and it's not pulling that fluid. So there is still fluid production, so the fluid tends to rise even further above the pump if you're seeing gas slugs. So, and this animation actually shows the surge valve in conjunction with the packer type gas separator. So this is kind of like a combination dual threat tool against gas slugging. And in this, you can see that you will see a more consistent pump fillage with a more consistent fluid level and more consistent production versus if you were, if you didn't have these tools and you're going to see the ups and downs and the, the peaks and troughs of the production. Thanks for bearing with us. And here we go. Continuing with the surge valve, the surge valve tool, it aims to eliminate the surging problem of the wells that I was mentioning earlier by holding that fluid above the packer and also being able to put that, get big gas look back into solution. You will see that the open flow of the tool, the open area of the tool will be pretty similar to the standing valve seat flow area with two and a half pumps. So this tool won't have any restriction for the production that you're going to be seeing in the well. So this tool will be able to produce. It's not going to slow anything down by you uh, installing this tool. And it will be installed below a packer. So it'll help you with most of those wells. And I had a question. This tool is actually installed. It has a dimensions of two and three eighths, two and seven eighths, three and a half. That question was from Will Davidson. Just want to answer that real quick. I don't think I can hear anymore. So, as I was mentioning earlier, this controls the gas slugs and P2 on top. And the way that we can control the valves, because the valve is just the ball and the Silicone nitrile ball is pretty light and it moves based on the pressures of the well. So P1 is the bottom hole pressure of the well and P2 will be that hydrostatic pressure on top of the packer. So this ball will move 
just depending on the, per the pressures of the well. So if the bottom hole pressure is more than the hydrostatic pressure on top, it'll keep that ball suspended in the fluid and it'll be continuing to produce. But let's say you're producing a lot and then finally there's a big fluid column on top of the packer that will finally shut that, shut that ball and it'll, the well will just produce that fluid column on top of the packer until it's pulled enough of that fluid level to have that bottom hole pressure above the hydrostatic pressure. So technically it's just going to be moving up and down based on that production. So if even on a rod pump, you may think that this ball will move based on the upstroke and the downstroke of the rod pump. That will be true in some cases, but in some instances it will be based on the pressure. So this ball is just moving completely based on the pressures. So this is why you would be able to use this tool in an ESP as well as any other artificial lift that may be encountering these issues. And one of the other benefits of having these pressure activated, the pressure activated movement of the ball and the pressure activated bypass system that I mentioned earlier, is this allows you to test your packer in the field because most, most times you use a packer in the field, it's kind of just a guessing game. If you produce, start producing fluid and there's not a seal, then it can really affect your production and you're going to have to pull the well if that packer is not sealed. So this is one of the only things in the field that will allow you to test your packer and make sure you are getting a seal in that well. And a secondary, really, uh, a secondary benefit to this tool besides just controlling your gas lugs and controlling your gas lugs and controlling that surge production that you see in the wells will be the hot oil application of this tool. So since you have that standing valve uh, like system at the bottom of the well, right beneath the packer, if you need a hot oil, that paraffin that you were seeing in the field, because your paraffin issues that you see in the solutions that are available to you are hot oiling, hot watering, and maybe just your chemical treatment through your capturing your surface treatment. But some people tend to like to use their hot oil. And what happens if you hot oil without this tool? then you have the hot oil traveling all the way down into the horizontal, potentially kind of damaging the perforations of that well. And in some instances, you're not gonna get that oil back for a couple of days. So I know, I've seen from experience that a certain operator, they use hot oil and it went down into the horizontal. They had nothing to stop that hot oil because they have bad paraffin issues throughout the entire field. So it's something they always do. And it went down into horizontal. And if you have very low bottom hole pressure, then that kills your well for two or three days. So this operator was losing two or three days worth of production just because he had to wait for that hot oil to be uh, recovered from that hot oil treatment. So with the installation of this tool, you're able to keep that hot oil above the packer and circulate it within a couple of hours and restart that production without any issues that you would encounter and also being able to uh, protect your perforations from any damage that you will be seeing from that whole hot oil. That's a good question. And um, some companies will see a negative to that standing valve, but as you can see here, we have that pressure activated bypass system that is activated at 3,500 PSI. So that's, um, that can be used if you do need to clean out your perforations from an acid job or you need to clean out your tools below the perforation or below the packer. So there is a bypass system that allows you to kind of get best of both worlds of keeping that hot oil treatment short and sweet, but also being able to do the acid treatment when you need it. So as, as you saw from that video earlier, here's a combination gas control that will give you the best of both worlds.
So as you saw the video, the surge valve is would typically want it to be used in conjunction with our packer type gas separator because this is kind of being seen as a robust, complete system for your gas issues that you're going to be seeing in your well. So first, you have the surge valve to control that surging and break the bigger gas lugs. You're going to be able to hold that fluid level above the packer, whether it be higher or lower, but just kind of a consistent uh, fluid level that your pump's always going to be able to pull fluid no matter how the well itself is producing. So you are be able to be a little bit more consistent. Secondly, you have the packer type gas separator. So once that gas is already in solution, you still have gas. So this allows you to separate the gas as a second stage. But one thing we do want to, we always like to preface everything with our customers is there are no magic solutions. There's nothing to that can solve if your well isn't producing up to your standards or if a well is not doing a certain thing that you want it to do. We can do our best to help control those gas issues and help your flow level. But if your well is not doing what you think it should, there's nothing we can do. But you can maybe in the future look for a high, more complex solution if it is needed. So here is a case study from Backslider 1. This was Backslider 3. This is the well that was installed, this combination gas separator with the surge valve. So in the beginning, this is our production graph. The fluid production was 164 barrels of fluid production a day with the water cut of 76 and the gas flow of 163. You can see it has pretty decently high gas and a pretty high gas oil ratio with the strokes per minute of nine and the pump fillage at this point was only 44%. And I do want to share that this well did have a gas separator at this point in the well life. So when we got the well, we took put our design in the well. We did our 24 foot slotted pack, slotted packer type gas separator with our surge valve. Everything below the well was the operator's suggestion. That's what they like to use. So they use an eight foot perforated sub with nothing for sand because they don't have any sand. They don't really see sand issues in their area, but they do see the high gas issues as you saw earlier. So we went with the packer type and a packer, a slim TAC and our surge valve for this well. And these were the results we got back afterwards. So the graph that I showed you right before this is what you see on the left, which did have a competitor's packer type gas separator in it. And to the right of the yellow line, you'll see this is when we installed our packer type gas separator with the surge valve. You can see the total production increased 106 and a half percent because before it was at about 164 barrels of fluid total barrels of fluid per day. And now we were producing well over 300, 300 average. And even though the gas went up, you will see that that can be seen as gas separation because they do measure their gas from the backside as well as the tubing. And the, another way we can say that this production increase, even with the gas separation, was due to this company using variable speed drive and their pump off controllers because if their pump fillage was low, as I mentioned earlier, at 44%, it definitely slowed down the pump of the, the speed of the pump and had pumped off sometimes. So we were able to produce more consistently versus before they had the tool. So yeah, as you can see right here, the left shows the total fluid with the gas oil ratio, gas liquid ratio, even though you saw the gas increase in that last graph, the gas oil ratio and gas liquid ratio decreased because we were able to increase that total production. And on the right, you can see that the average pump fillage was 44% before, and afterwards, it was 75% with the installation of our tools. And as I was mentioning earlier, is you can see the blue line is actually the strokes per minute. So before we installed our tool, the stroke per minute would decrease and increase, and it was fluctuating. So that tells you that they're using their variable speed drive or they're pumping off, especially on the day where it just completely dips. They had to turn off for some reason. And after that, they had to increase the speed and decrease based on the low pump fillage. And afterwards, when you're getting an average pump fillage of 75%, that pump speed was consistent, 9.6 consistent throughout this installation. And it's still in the well right now, but this is what we have for our data. But we have our average pump fillage of 75 with a consistent pump speed because they never had to really slow down because that surge valve was able to keep that gas level above the pump even when there was a big surge of gas that left behind some production. 
So in conclusion, the slugging is common in horizontal wells due to the fluid depletion, pressure decreases in well geometry. You will see this throughout the Permian Basin, especially in these wells that are fracked because they do tend to deplete a lot more. So this is a pretty common issue because you go from uh, gas in solution to slugging wells. Secondly, the surge valve can help control that the gas slugs by breaking them down and holding that fluid above a packer. That's the main thing we can take away is the surge valve allows for one direction fluid production by keeping that fluid above the packer and keeping it from falling it back down into that kickoff point where you saw a lot of that turbulence and uh, fluid slippage in those videos that we demonstrated earlier. Running a surge valve in conjunction with the packer type gas separator system can definitely be seen as a robust system to handle the fluid levels and the gas separation of the tool. And another benefit of the surge valve will be to decrease the hot oil recovery time that most a lot of people with paraffin issues will see because they will a lot of people tend to use hot oiling systems and this also protects your perforations from damage from that hot oil or hot water that you will be using and uh, as a bypass system the surge valve has a spring activated bypass system if you do need to get downhole below that packer to help treat those perforations or just do scale treatment or corrosion treatment or anything that you may need Below the pack here, there is a bypass this bypass system that is built in with different pressure activation points based on the depth of the well because you do see wells at 10,000 feet, you do see some at 5,000 feet. So some are going to have higher fluid columns, some are going to have lower fluid columns. So we can design based on your depth of your well at the same time. So if anyone has any questions. So does as far as pumping down or setting the pressure, do you have like a nitrogen charge bellows or how do you change what pressure? So we have the nitrogen charge bellows that you see a gas lift and they're just uh, rated on different pressures. So okay. you can start like some are as low as fifteen hundred and you can go up to about six or seven thousand. But they're based in fee, but we convert into uh, pressure PSI. So far. The system, you still the packer. <laughs> well. Yeah, so and you would have to use a mechanical packer in that sense. So in that case, you wouldn't be able to use like a, I mean, you could use a packer. You just need to use a packer in the system because the surge valve holds the fluid above. If there's not a packer, then the fluid will just fall around the backside in between the casing and the tubing. Do you have a, like no kind of the standard array of Allergies for the wall? You know, uh, what we use is the um, silicone nitride because that is the lightest and most flexible wall in, that we've seen in the field that will be able to handle the production. If you get a heavier ball, sometimes you might need a heavier bottom hole pressure to lift that ball. So we want the lightest ball possible that won't restrict the fluid production from coming through the ball system. So it will handle solids and sands, basically the same way a standing valve does. So if you do have solids or sand issues in your well, then you will need to use a solid, a sand desander or sand protection system just in case. But right above the, the ball is a really big, wide open area. So it won't trap as much, but we would still recommend to use a sand system in this case. All right, that's it. Then if I have any questions online from anyone on Skype or Zoom. You had one from Will Davidson. What are some of the limitations you've seen testing? Um, Carlos answered there for the walls with sand problems. The manufacturer of the surge valve uh, were noticed. This will prevent erosion. If the sand protection is too secure, you will need a sand control system. Okay. Oh, Will Davidson asked, what are some of the limitations you've seen in testing? And one of my colleagues answered, so far in the well sand problems, we can manufacture the surge valve. So far is sand issues is what some of the limitations we can see due to erosion and packing that ball on top, but we can also since we are manufacturing, we can boronize 
that tool on the inside because boronization will protect against the erosion. So, and when that, where the seat is at, if it starts to erode from the sand, then maybe that seat, the ball won't be able to steal and see as efficiently as it should to create that perfectly tight seal. So definitely boronizing that section would help eliminate that issue. So Juan per demo asks, what is the gas separation efficiency between a gas, a Packard gas separator versus Packard gas separator with the surge valve? So the efficiency of the gas separator will be the same. The main benefit of the surge valve would be to hold that fluid above the Packard and give you more fluid to produce. But the Packard type gas separator will uh, have around the same efficiency, maybe five maybe five to 7% more efficiency with the surge valve, but it still would be relatively similar. So without the surge valve. Do you all uh, provide the Packer or is it a third party? So the Packer will be provided by a third party. We have cut Packers that we provide, but uh, for gas separation, we would recommend using maybe a third party rotational packer, as in what this operator did. They use a ro uh, rotational packer because those tend to give you a better seal. And uh, yeah, that'd be third party. Just That usually just depends on the operator's preference because some people just don't want to use rotational packers. Some people don't want to use cut packers. But we can always give our recommendations. And doesn't look like there's any more questions from Zoom. So I thank you guys for coming. I appreciate you all coming to the lunch and learn. It's nice to actually have a presentation in person after a long 2020. But thank you. Um, yeah, thanks guys for coming. Thanks, Jonathan, for coming out to talk to us today. And thank you, OSI, for hosting the luncheon today. Uh, we've got four events lined up for next month in March, so a lot going on. Uh, our next general meeting is going to be on March 23rd, and it's going to be sponsored by Ideal Energy Solutions from or with Parker Reeves as a speaker on flow assurance, preventing and remediating paraffin and asphalt.